everybody. This is Ryan McClanahan with HistoryThroughCards.com. I hope you're all doing very well today. So a while back, I got a very interesting request from Chris from Stories and Cardboard asking me if I would uh, give out a few tips and tricks on how I do research. And actually, I thought that was a very good idea. So I'm going to share that with you today. Um, and the first thing is, you know, when I was growing up as a new card uh, new vintage card collector uh, about the age of 14 or so I didn't really have uh, a whole lot of people uh, that I could turn to for this information it was the stuff that um, I had really wanted to learn and uh, information about the cards themselves was uh, few and far between now there was Beckett back then obviously but Beckett didn't really do a whole lot with, say, uh, cards like this, um, the T206s. Uh, they were more; of, it was more of a modern card magazine, starting from about 1948 and going down. So, uh, unfortunately, I was kind of stuck um, when I uh, when I saw these kinds of cards in the uh, sh the card shop, and, and when I was in the fourth grade. Uh, I had asked asked a couple of questions to the dealer uh, when I when he showed one to me in person. Uh, he didn't know a whole lot about them. Um, in fact, uh, when I was a kid, there was a lot of publications that said that the um, say the sweet caporal, especially um, the advertisements on the back were the actual uh, companies themselves, and that is not the case. Um, today we know that the American Tobacco Company was the issuer of the card, uh, and the lithographer was uh, American uh, Lithograph Company uh, in New York. Uh, but that information only comes through research. So um, I'm going to just kind of go through some of that with you, and uh, press a like and subscribe uh, if you do end up liking this uh, information. So uh, there's a lot of different ways to go about researching uh, sports cards and for me it's a little bit different because well, I'm not just researching the card itself, I'm researching the player, I'm researching the company, the owner, uh, and basically anything that has to do with the printing of the card, uh, the lettering, so I'm going and I'm gonna go through like all of that. So I'm I'm pretty thorough, but uh, you guys might not want to be that thorough, um, as I'm generally writing about this stuff, um, and just kind of like on here for 20 minutes. And um, anyway, so one of the first things that I'm going to do if I'm going to write about a card set is I'm gonna go through uh, Bob Lemke's uh, massive, massive book. Oh, and this thing's heavy too. <laughs> the standard catalog of baseball cards. Uh, Bob Lemke uh, was a hobby pioneer. Um, he's probably one of the first to actually do something like this back in, I believe, 1981. Um, anyway, uh, so I'm going to go through the checklist and I'm generally going to look at uh, any ball player that is of interest or important to a set. Now, for me personally, I actually like to research more of your, your average everyday Joe. That's just me because um, I like the underdog. But uh, for a lot of you guys, you might want to research about you know, Ted Williams or Babe Ruth or whoever, and that's great. I actually happen to think that those guys are actually um, covered quite a bit. Um, it's Babe Ruth is a little bit different story than Ted Williams, uh, in the fact that uh, I have noticed just uh, reading that there's a lot that Babe Ruth did that is not published today. Uh, I, I happen to think that uh, through digitization, um, we really have uh, a better. Um, Outlook, I guess, or a better understanding of a lot of your major superstars 
Uh, it is the smaller your Hall of Famers that your your tier Hall of Famers in baseball that are not really well researched uh, or teams and this is where SABR really comes in handy. Uh, you guys can all join SABR and become writers yourself and I highly recommend it. Um, there is also a professional football research association that I belong to as well um, and it's more or less I think 500 or so um, uh, researchers and writers but that is a great place as well and both of those um, organizations have uh, their their uh, online as well and and you can go and, and knock yourself out and I, I highly recommend both of them anyway um, what they're going to also do is they're going to give you or you can find one of these and so I actually purchased a, a hard copy now they do have them online as well on their site uh, and what this is is it, it is a um, it is a style book and so style books are, are really kind of for journalists uh, I, I have three different kinds that I use for reference um, and this is this one right here is from the New York Times from 1956 and this is the the one from SABR uh, and, and for a lot of journalists um, and a lot of people who want to write stories um, for a specific group, that group is going to want you to format and write in a certain way. <laughs> um, and that's why, that's why they, they come out with these style books. Now, sometimes you're, you're, you know, you can thumb through it and they're going to give you a lot of uh, hints and tricks and tips uh, and, and the more you write um, the better you're going to be the more you research the better you're going to be so um, I I will go through those but I generally don't need them and a lot of a lot of writers just kind of put them in their desk and forget about them um, but that's one one way and I, I do recommend it I also have the AP version as well um, and I think that's been updated uh, in any event here's what I'm going to do so um, I might grab a card like this and if you've never seen anything like this uh, you're gonna know you're gonna want to know what it is I, I already happen to know what it is because it's I've been around for a long time um, but uh, if I'm going to write about it first thing I'm going to do is I'm gonna look at the back so uh, let me see if this will focus come on baby focus focus all right well unfortunately it's not working today as, as well I thought but right here is the copyright so uh, it says copyright 1941 Gum Inc, uh, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And just um, for reference, everything on the card is um, going to help you out. Everything. Um, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go to, like, say, the Boston Public Library or a library, um, and I'm going to uh, check out the copyright entries for a specific year so in this case 1941 and I'm going to uh, write everything I can about that entry because it's going to show you more things that are not on here but may be relevant and the thing is you really kind of don't know what is relevant until you actually write down everything and then start to uh, the process of writing uh, an article um, so for our, for me personally, I might actually, I might actually write three to four uh, pages just for one section, um, and I'm going to uh, check it several times, different sources. Um, you always want to trust but verify, as Ronald Reagan used to say, uh, because 
as you know, I have here in the back, I have all these auction catalogs. And the first thing that I know about auction houses is that they're in uh, the business of selling you the card. That's not necessarily what uh, the information is. You know, you have to check the accuracy of these things. And one of the one of the things that we know as, as card collectors is that um, it's it's the Honus Wagner uh, theory, and basically what that is is that um, <laughs> is that for every T two hundred six Honus Wagner, there's a great story behind it, and that's because these guys here want to sell you that Honus Wagner. So a, a lot of times they're going to make up a great story. Uh, and it might not have a lot to do with the actual truth. Um, you know, things like the T206 Wagner and the 1933 or 34 Gaudi um, Napalajue have great stories behind them. Um, and I actually wrote about uh, Horner's, I wrote about both of these guys, but I wrote about uh, the Napalajue uh, story and um, how it might not actually be accurate um, for the, the 1934 Gaudi set. So um, that's what I'm going to do first is um, go through the, the copyright. The next thing I'm going to do uh, is if you can see here if this thing will ever, um, let me see if it'll, okay. So you can obviously see it says Philadelphia PA. Uh, on it, but where in Philadelphia? So um, I'm going to go through a telephone book from the era. Uh, generally, I'm going to try to stick with like say 1941, or if it's the um, the D Long set from 1933, uh, I'm going to try to find a telephone book from 1933. Uh, if not, the year prior or the year after. Uh, just to kind of narrow everything down. Now, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna find <laughs> in that the address. Now, sometimes the farther back you go, uh, this can be a little bit difficult because um, streets can change, uh, addresses can change, that the name of the street can change. Obviously, which is what happened to the um, the leaf uh, leaf products uh, company, um, Saul Leaf, is a little bit of a sketchy dude. So uh, I actually kind of know that already from the guy. Um, and I think he was trying to evade taxes. However, um, that company, uh, the street address changed, um, I believe, after the uh, company issued their cards. So um, I'm going to go through that. And then uh, sometimes, if it's a ball player that I'm actually going to research, uh, some of the, some of the magazines are pretty good too. They'll they'll list everything from the player, uh, his name, his wife, his kids, his dog. Um, which is really kind of sketchy. You wouldn't want to do that today, obviously, and it's not done today. But back in the 1950s, uh, these magazines did have. Everything from their, their the player's wife's name to the ages of his children and his home address. Uh, so you can find a lot of home addresses that way. Uh, but, uh, you know, again, it's kind of sketchy, but um, that's what they used to do. Now, in the same form was also in the telephone book, too, for owners uh, of these companies. And they'll give the home address and the business address and the wife's address uh, name as well. Um, now I, I had kind of a, an issue with the uh, the printer of the 1933 Dean Long. I know exactly where it is in Boston, but it's not there, and it's not there now. And and here's the thing, is that. Um, there's a lot of businesses that issued sports cards that are no longer around, and the um, the landscape of the city is always changing. So the uh, the D Long Company uh, obviously it no longer exists. Some of these 
these companies haven't existed in 70, 80, 90, or 100 plus years, uh, which makes research a little difficult as well. Um, and so I'm going to try my best to link up uh, what is going on in the city as well or surrounding the card manufacturer. And if I'm lucky, I can get a photograph. Um, if not, I have to kind of piece together uh, things like a puzzle. Uh, the other thing too is uh, because I deal with uh, businesses and business owners uh, and, and hobby historians and you know people who started or founded the hobby, you're not always going to find a photograph for this stuff. Um, and you'll have to go sometimes if you're if you're lucky, uh, there will be a um, uh, either a museum or a college that will have uh, materials and documentation and photographs, but uh, you will not be able to get it online. You can um, you can put in for it online, but sometimes you might have to actually go to the actual source. Um, and in that case, what they're going to ask you to do is, and, um, in my case, I've had um, I've had a lot of strange looks. <laughs> uh, I, I went to one college where they lost their library. <laughs> Actually, they moved it, and they didn't know where. They didn't know exactly where it was. Very odd. Um, but <laughs> they're going to ask you to have a piece of paper and a pencil uh, to write things down. Uh, if you have a pen, it's no good. For whatever reason that is, I've never really found out why. But um, for a lot of notation, they're going to ask you to write down in a pencil. Uh, you can take a lot of photography, but I always also try to um, give credit uh, where credit is due to these organizations as well and the people who have uh, allowed me to um, get access to this information. Um, and if you read or fall asleep to any of my articles, you're going to notice the, re the resources, the reference uh, section, and um, it's it kind of reads like a, a, a who who's or what what. Um, in it, and you'll be kind of surprised, at least I am, about the things that I've read. Now, um, I'm also going to go through a lot of uh, legal journals, and I'm also going to go through um, a, a lot of uh, other government uh, documents as well, uh, such as the, the labor, uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, um, and. Uh, for that, if I don't know a word or something, uh, I'm usually going to either go to the dictionary or I'm going to go to like Black's Law Dictionary um, and then find out what the word is that I don't know. And then um, on top of it, uh, I'm going to uh, usually, um, if there's a card I don't know about, I'm always going to get a second opinion on that card. Now, I actually had to do this with uh, this card right here. This is a 1967 Topps Joe Namath. But the thing is with the with this card right here is that there's two versions, um, and there's a 1960, I believe 67 or 68 Topps uh, Milton Bradley, and I actually was not familiar with this set uh, for a long time, and then I came I came across one, and I was like, "What's this? This is this is really kind of strange." And the thing was was that the the bottom or the top of the card had a strange line that looked like a 1968 top set. So I wasn't familiar with this, and I didn't want to purchase something that I obviously I wasn't familiar with. Um, and so I, I, I went to Dakota from Sports Cards Anonymous and I asked him about that set and he went and researched it for me. Uh, so I, I, wanted to, uh, I wanted to find out more and I did find out more. 
And so I went to a, a, another resource, uh, which was Dakota. Now, uh, two heads row is better than one. So uh, if there's something that you don't know, there are always different outlets for you to uh, contact other researchers and other um, historians or collectors. Uh, YouTube is always a great place, but um, you know, SABR is another place, like I just said. And, and so there's always going to be someone who A, knows more than you or me, and then B, there's, there's always going to be someone to help you out. Uh, in my case, growing up, I did have a small group of older collectors to help me out uh, when I first started. Um, and it was, it was pretty great. Um, there are still things uh, that I don't know about, which, which is why I'm always going to go and, and seek out a second opinion. <laughs> and then um, on top of this, so uh, you're also going to want to know a few other things um, aside from just the research aspects, uh, you know, besides the name, you know, who, what, where, when, why, and how, right? So with a lot of sports cards, you also have the um, the the numbers part, all right? All right. So with a lot of statistics, uh, those come from box scores, and you know, not all box scores are known for a lot of the ball players, especially in the minor leagues and the Negro leagues as well. Um, or even sometimes the Pacific Coast League, which is considered the third league. Um, there are different kinds of statistics. So if you're looking for a, a ball players' uh, stats on field, that's one thing. Um, but if you're looking for statistics for pricing data, um, <coughs> that kind of also falls in the line of a ball player statistics, where not everything is known. And, and that's because um, for a few reasons. The, the first reason is that um, <clears throat> it is uh, kind of a, before Beckett, there was the uh, the Sport Americana, and it's right here. So uh, it, it came out on a yearly basis, <clears throat> um, and not everything is is like up to. I shouldn't say up to date, but. Um, so 1981, uh, Beckett ended up doing a lot of like hockey, base, basketball, uh, football, golf, um, and and boxing, but <clears throat> that stuff really didn't start to appear in a price guide until maybe the early eight, uh, late 80s, early 90s. So um, it is few and far between. Uh, the other thing is that if you can see in back of me, I got the 1967 uh, American Card Catalog. So that came out not every not every year, but um, every few years. So <clears throat> the first uh, price guide came out in 1939, and it was updated in 1940, 41, 42, uh, and maybe even 43. But um, and those updates are are very rare today. Uh, I, I've maybe seen one, I think, from 1942. Um, and that's a different animal altogether. So you have uh, an update to the catalog in 1946, 1953, and 1956 is actually a copy of the 1953 uh, catalog. Um, and so... Pricing data for those years were actually uh, conducted through uh, um, Charles Bray's uh, auction house. Um, he's one of the first auctioneers of card uh, card collections dating back to 1943. Um, and that's where a lot of that stuff was coming from. Now, um, James Beckett did things a lot differently. Um, and I think they're a lot more accurate. But <laughs> um, when you're when you're doing um, basically uh, this kind of data, 
you have to generally have a sense of who the ball player is or what the situation is. And and um, I'll give you a perfect example of how I screwed up. Um, I was doing research on the um, on the Yellow Jackets uh, football team and um, on a ball player in Walter French from 1933. Um, now he also played for the uh, the Maroons as well. So he was actually a, a football player and a baseball player at the same time. Um, now, uh, I had forgotten, or at least I probably didn't, more likely I didn't know this, that the uh, Frankfurt Yellow Jackets um, were a, uh, a semi-pro football team before they turned professional. Um, and so I had gotten confused and thought that he was a professional um, before this and that it wasn't registered in uh, footballreference.com. Now, football reference and, and baseballreference.com are good resources that I think everybody should go to and I think everybody does. Um, there are still a lot of uh, gaps that need to be filled. And uh, this is where... Um, we can find them in newspaper sources. So when you're looking over a newspaper source, um, generally like what I do is I'm going to list uh, three different uh, newspapers or I'm going to have them written down um, and then I'm going to make a decision if they all kind of line up together or if there's different um, parts of the newspaper that are completely different. And then I'm going to make a decision whether or not it's correct. Um, generally, I, I found that this, this, the same story will be in multiple newspapers at the same time. So you can kind of pick and choose there. Um, and so uh, when it comes to uh, box scores, uh, especially with Negro League uh, ballplayers, uh, I found that they are um, in a lot of the, the black-owned newspapers at the time, and they're the ones that are, are um, basically, they're the ones that are, are uh, covering Negro League uh, baseball more so than the white uh, newspapers at, at the time, and that makes perfect sense as well. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, when it comes to researching a, uh, an, an owner of one of these card issuing uh, companies. Um, <clears throat> the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to find out who the owner is. Now, if you're, if you're looking at, say, a 1933 D-Long set, and in the back of it, it says D-Long Company, um, I, I now know that, that okay, D-Long I know that, and I know that the company is from Boston. Um, and, and myself, uh, me being from Boston, uh, it, it is um, really interesting that there could be uh, different uh, streets or the same street name uh, in different sections of the city. And that happens throughout the United States. Um, so in, in the case of D. Long, uh, I did everything you just heard about, but I got the street name wrong <laughs> because uh, N Street and North Street um, to me were kind of confusing. And um, like I said, parts of the city have changed, especially my city. Um, and so I, uh, <clears throat> I finally got it. I finally got it down, but it took a lot of research to find the actual street uh, name. And and the other thing you can do too is uh, go to a map, find a map of the city uh, at the time of the card's issuance uh, as well. And so <clears throat> once you find that and you can narrow that down, uh, it, it, things might be a little bit easier. Um, I, I kind of also go through the birth date and the death date of both the ball player and the owner as well. And I try to find out uh, as much as I can about the uh, the company and, you know, what 
what the financial situation of the company is as well. Because if you can find out what the financial situation of the company is and how much money they had for advertising revenue, uh, you can f pretty much find out um, how many <laughs> how many cards uh, that company could have issued. Uh, the 1933 uh, D. Long set, uh, and especially the the 1933 George C. Miller set, um, they uh, uh, they were basically a product or an end product of the Great Depression, um, which hit um, Boston in about 1934 really hard. Um, and, and in the case of uh, George C. Miller, uh, his company didn't go bankrupt, but it did reorganize uh, through a bankruptcy. Um, so <clears throat> uh, what I did was I wanted to find out more about the bankruptcy. So I read the laws on on it, which were uh, were different at the time. Now, if I wanted to find out more about copyrights, I would go and I'd research the copyrights, not the laws today, but the laws that were written at the time of the card's issuance. So, in particular, this card right here. Uh, there's a lot going on in these cards, these T206s, and you may realize. I actually wrote a fairly lengthy 60-page article, and I've got two more on the way. In fact, uh, I, when, I'm, when everything's said and done, I'm probably going to have 10 60-page articles on these sets, the uh, T205 and T207. So it is lengthy, but um, I make sure to go through everything. I'm a madman, too. so. I don't mind. Uh, at least it's in one area, in one space that you can go and read. Uh, unlike what I used to have to do when I was a, a teenager, um, going from place to place to place and then finding tidbits of information, which drove me absolutely crazy. So um, <laughs> on the back of this card, uh, and you're, you're going to see... Uh, Everything here has a story to it. Every everything, um, the factory number as well is in the bottom, and people are like, "What is this?" Uh, like I did. So um, everything's going to tell you a little bit about, it. and and if you can imagine um, that, <clears throat> it's what what a lot of the stuff is going to do is it's going to um, Give you a direction in which you want to follow some some um, things that I might read or research might end up in at a black like a a wall if you will um, I might do research for a month on one thing and um, I might think that I might have it all solved and then all of a sudden nothing it leads to a dead end. So, um, with the with the back of this, I uh, I researched the copyright law of 1909. Um, I researched a few other laws, and, and a lot of times with this particular set uh, is the law. Um, you and I hate to be political about this stuff because I hate politics, but um, unfortunately. Uh, or fortunately, this this particular set uh, was born and died through politics. Um, it was politics that started the tobacco uh, craze in 1909, uh, and it was also politics that killed it as well. <laughs> so um, I actually I researched a lot of um, the politics behind the set. Uh, in order to learn more about how the set was issued. Um, and that meant actually reading the, the 1909 copyright uh, law, and not only that, the right of privacy uh, as well, and uh, photography as well. Because if you think about it, photography was still well, kind of new. I mean, it, yeah, it was around since 1830s, right, 1839 or so. But um, the way it was used when these cards were first issued was kind of new and um, 
So there was a a um, a pretty famous uh, right of privacy law um, from 1903, uh, which basically um, they had to follow in New York uh, in order to get the player to sign uh, his life away uh, for the card. And that was left up to the, um, uh, the what was it? Uh, the sports writer of each city. Um, so once you know that and you can follow and trace this stuff, it's going to be a lot easier for you to uh, do research this way. Um, the other the other ways that I do research as well is um, by asking questions and um, and then kind of like. I will um, directly contact uh, people, ball players, business owners, and I will ask them a series of questions. And I will interview these these people um, for my articles. And then um, <clears throat> some things are off the record. Obviously, a lot of my conversations with ball players are usually off the record. Um, it's a little bit different if they've passed away, and then I'll tell a story later on. Uh, I, I may be covered. Uh, the one thing that I really don't want to do um, is you know, I don't like to disparage people, and I don't like it when other people disparage other people as well without um, either giving context to the story or backing it up with actual fact. Um, and, and that's how you get uh, into legal trouble uh, as well. Um, so, um, the, the easiest way to do that is um, by uh, researching, writing, interviewing. And inter interviewing takes, is a special skill all, all to itself. Uh, and it takes a while. It, even somebody who is uh, used to interviewing on either a weekly or monthly basis uh, still might have problems interviewing depending on the person so what I usually try to do is um, I treat everybody the same uh, no matter if it's the garbage man or if it's the mayor of Boston uh, I view them as the same person I don't treat people um, any differently than I would want to be treated and it, it goes along um, better and smoother if you do that um, a lot of people get starry-eyed when they come across ball players or personalities or actresses and actors and i've done so many interviews uh that it's just it's an you know kind of like your average normal day and these are just your average normal people and i got a lot of tips uh on that from johnny pesky uh of the boston red sox of all people uh, and he used to tell me never to um, ask a ball player a specific event, especially if they're an older ball player. Because if you think about it, uh, as we age, our memories are not as sharp uh, as they used to be. And so uh, I usually kind of tended not to ask a ball player uh, about a specific event. Instead, a lot of the conversations that I used to have with, say, Duke Snyder or Bob Feller or other than baseball, and then I'd allow them to um, talk about baseball uh, or specific events that they remembered um, freely. And I would not really try to um, get them in, in that direction. I would let them do that for me. And then <clears throat> uh, and that, that made it so uh, not only did I have an interest in the player but the player's uh, life in general, and and uh, and what their experiences were, and um, and then I'd go back and I would uh, pick apart the the details there and then what they said, and um, if I didn't feel that it was uh, a part of the story that I wanted to tell, or if it was um, if there was something that was contradicting. Or contradictory, uh, I would leave it alone. And, and a lot of these stories I never have really told before, um, which is fine. I, I, uh, I'll take a few of them to the grave. But uh, 
that's really kind of what I wanted to tell you guys about today. I'll probably have more of this stuff in the future. And if there's anything that uh, you can think of that may help you, I would like to hear about it my, uh, myself uh, and what helps you. So uh, with that, guys, I really appreciate it. Um, click a like and subscribe uh, and uh, go over to Chris's page as well and check out his stuff too. And I, I really kind of enjoy uh, his take on stuff and a, a lot of other YouTubers as well. There's some great YouTubers uh, that will help you out as well. So uh, anyway, guys, I uh, appreciate it. And until the next time, have a good one. Bye.